It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. It's the Take Command podcast. What's up? What's happening? Craig Hoffman here. Logan Paulson there. Next week, Logan, we do this in Indianapolis. NFL Combine just a week away, which means the rumor mill will kick into high gear regarding NFL free agency. And that is where we're going to spend most of our time today. Um, And actually, the free agency lists are kind of out there. PFF did their big uh, 200-player ranking. But also, I think it's worth noting, and something that will happen over the course of the next week that we're going to touch on here, is players are going to get cut um, for cap savings purposes. And so what the commanders especially can do with the league leading amount of free agent money that they have uh, is going to be very interesting and and could be more interesting. So we'll get into all of that over the next uh, half hour or so. And then Logan, we're going to play a game. I love it. What's the game, Craig? The game is going to be commander's coach trivia. So the commanders now have their entire coaching staff and there's all kinds of fun connections and fun facts about the commander's coaches. And so in an effort to let you, uh, Logan, and you, the audience, know these coaches better, I put together a little trivia. Uh, So we'll do that at the end of the show. But let's start off talking free agency. Let's let's start super high level here. Obviously, there you, you can put together a plan on paper of how you want to attack certain positions. Oh, ideally draft here, ideally free agency here. That can do everything from your own personal desires of what, how you see each position, the importance of experience at it, et cetera, to the market themselves. Is the draft deep at one position versus free agency class in another? So when you think of that super high level, and, and if you were in Adam Peters' chair putting together a plan of attack, how would you be attacking free agency for Washington? Well, I think the first thing I'd look at is just, you know, the the edge market specifically. I think, you know, this is a decent edge rusher class in the draft, but I it's not exceptional. I think there are some guys that, that really get you excited, but I think they're going to go before the commanders are picking. And there's one guy in Darius Robinson who we talked about quite a bit from Missouri who – he could potentially be there at 36, but you know he's a really good football player. He's moving up boards, so it seems less and less likely as the process moves on. But I think edge is a is a position that they need to do some work on. And I and people say, oh, we've got you know Andre Jones, we've got KJ Henry, and I say, well, you know you need multiple guys there. You almost need six deep at that position. So you probably need to re-sign a Casey Tuhill, James Smith Williams type of guy. You probably want to draft a edge rusher if, if the opportunity presents itself, but that still leaves one more person you need. And I think one of these edges, um, you know, a Jadavian Clowney type guy, you know, it doesn't need to be that guy, but a guy that's not going to be uber expensive is a guy that, that sticks out to me as, as, as good value, you know, seven, eight million dollars a year uh, and not breaking the bank. Obviously, you need to re-sign a corner with Kendall Fuller hitting the free agent market. Safety probably need to look at re-signing somebody. Um with Cam Curl being up. So those are some things that really stick out to me. And also I think it's interesting that there's a couple pretty high value free agent linebackers on the market that maybe you could make a move for to kind of strengthen the middle of your defense. So I think that's kind of what I would look at. Obviously a lot of that's on the defensive side of the football. I think you need a third wide receiver, but the thing about a third wide receiver is I don't think you need to be stressing for that because in the draft this year, like as we've talked about a little bit, like you could fall on your face and find a receiver that's going to contribute this year. Like there, there's a lot of really good slot third down third third receiver type guys they're going to be big ads to your roster you know third down running back Uh, pretty much every running back in this class has caught the ball really well and has some third down ability so i don't think you need to be going crazy there offensive tackle offensive guard if you want to kind of beef up there i think it's a very very dense group at those positions um, and they've got some very talented football players they're going to be day one starters so uh, offensively i think you feel pretty good about maybe attacking some of these needs in the draft and and getting good value getting a fifth round running back getting a third round wide receiver getting a second round uh, offensive tackle or offensive guard maybe an edge rusher if one were to fall with that other pick there and feel excellent about what you got going on going into the season um but i think defensively that's an area where you got to say hey that we got to make a push here in free agency to kind of to, to make an impact on this roster yeah definitely um i think you hit on a couple of of great points obviously in there for me um you know offensively the biggest thing is is offensive line True. and i would like to get one offensive lineman in free agency i'd also like to attack that in the draft that is that is a yes and scenario for me yeah. ideally 
I think I'd like to find, I mean, I, I think we both agree our kind of ideal situation is finding a right tackle, um, kicking yeah. Wiley inside to guard. Now, all of a sudden, you've got Wiley, Stromberg, Cosme, new free agent right tackle, and then you either bring back Leno or you draft one um, or both if you don't if you take like a Patrick Paul who you don't think is going to be ready immediately but think in a year could be a stud. Um, so I, I think those are the kinds of things you're looking at on the offensive side of the ball. Obviously, like, like you talked about a ton and we've talked about a ton, this wide receiver class is insane in the draft. And so whether that means you go draft a big X or draft a slot guy and bump, uh, you know, if you draft a big X, then you bump everyone over a spot, including Jahan into the slot. Uh, and, or you, you draft that guy and Terry says your X and Jahan says your Z, whatever way you want to attack it, like, cool, go ahead. Um, but I think that's, that's a draft situation. Um, I, I, safety is super interesting. Um, I think we should circle back to edge as well, but let's, let's start with safety because I am, I am of the camp slightly, not that I feel super strongly about this, but I am of the camp that I would not resign cam curl. Um, and mm. I've got a couple of reasons for that. One, yeah, one is you drafted Quan Martin, who is, I think a better version of the same player, super versatile, can play all over the place. Um, and you've got other safeties in Butler and Forrest that you can pair with them. Like how many do you need? And when it comes to allocation of resources, eventually they've got to do the thing that they failed to do in the last administration, which is draft a replacement and live with the replacement. Quan Martin is drafted in part as Cam Curl is leaving insurance. And so let him leave. You can't keep paying the same guys because then you wind up overloaded at certain positions. That said, I do trust, obviously, this group's evaluation, and I also wonder if they look at Quan as a nickel, in which mm. case looking going back and signing Cam Curl makes a lot more sense because now you do need that safety depth because Quan is not a safety. But that is kind of where I stand. I also, though, look at the free agent list right now, and there's a couple of really good safeties that I think are better than Cam Curl, and if I'm going to spend big money, especially with a new defense coming in, I'm not like the incumbency doesn't matter as much to me. Like obviously Antoine Winfield is the top safety in the market. Do you want to go sign him instead? Um, there is, let's see who else is out there. Uh, Kyle, I think Kyle um, Duggar from new England. is Yeah. Guy Duggar. Yeah. Duggar, you know, God, imagine with the versatility that they, they use yeah. players within this defense, what they could do with him. So like, I, I, I would say my plan C would be re-sign cam curl. My plan A would just be spend the money elsewhere. Plan yeah. B would be go sign one of these other dudes. But if we wind up landing on plan C, Cam Curl's a really good football player. I'm not mad about it at all. Just I think his lack of ball production um, and the fact that Quan can do pretty much all of the same stuff leads me to saying like, hey, let's use that money on something else. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, I think it's, it's interesting with Cam, and I think it really just depends on what you're going to be paying for him in this process. I think that's the thing that really sticks out because, you know, you're looking at some of this like over the cap information and they do a pretty good job of predicting potential salaries and things like that. And Cam is in that $14.1 million a year. And obviously Kyle Duggar and Antoine Winfield Jr. are a little bit more expensive, but like that's kind of the market they think he's cultivated for himself. Now, maybe you feel differently if that's a 10 a year. And I think you probably would feel pretty good about that number for a guy who's a good tackler, instinctive football player, um, gives you some flexibility. I think about you talk about, you know, what you could be in this uh, Dan Quinn um, you know, defense or defensive structure uh, that'll led, be led by Joe Witt, obviously. I think there's an interesting opportunity there to kind of say, hey, like we can, he can be our curse in this system. He can be our kind of big linebacker or, he, or our, our, our safety that's playing linebacker, Buffalo nickel player. So um, does he have a role? And, and is that role worth the price tag that he is probably going to, you know, kind of has earned over the course of his career? So that's kind of what I would say. And again, there's a lot of good players. I think there's okay safety depth in this class too some guys that are very unique tall kind of rangy guys so maybe you go back to the well there for a position that the nfl statistically or analytically isn't like you know we got to get elite safety play all the time you know it's more like we can get a guy and survive and obviously if you have an elite safety you're okay but i think to your point is cam curl a top five player at the position is he a top 10 player at the position I couldn't tell you. I would, right? I would I say probably do. not considering we both have two guys we'd rather take in this free agent class. And so unless yeah. you're third in the free agent class and just so happens that three of the top five dudes at the position in the league are free agents this year, like it's a hard sell. 
Yeah, and again, I'm not being we're not being critical of Cam. We think he's a good football player, obviously, but you know, it's 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 about comparisons here. It's about comparisons in the market. So I, I kind of understand what you're saying there. And um, you know, I, I'm always an advocate for players getting paid and making as much money yeah, as possible. Someone should pay Cam Curl. I just right. don't know whether it's this team because of what they have in house. In that uh, position, I, you have Percy Butler, you have Derek Forrest, and Butler to me is a backup, but Forrest is a starter, and so is Quan Martin. So right. why are you paying a third starter unless, again, you think Quan Martin is a starter at a different position? Well, I think you just look at Dallas and what they did. You know, I think, and you say they're going to need a lot of safeties. It's just like how many and what kind of body types you're looking for because they had, you know, kind of two box linebacker type players. They had two post players. They had a package where there's five safety type bodies on the field. And it does, in terms of the body type of the NFL, you know, that's the most flexible defensive body type, you know, in terms of what it gives you from the back end. You get guys who can take on blocks with their length, their physicality, guys that can cover tight ends, can match up with slot receivers. So I could see them making a move saying we need more depth here. Sure. Um, and again, like it just, it depends on what the, what the vision is of Adam and, and Dan and, and what those conversations look like. But I agree with you. Like it's, can you upgrade this? Can you find someone that fits the vision a little bit more acutely? So those are all things to consider with Cam. Again, Cam, go make your money. We're excited for you. This is a great opportunity. But again, is, is this the right fit for him? Is this the right fit financially for, for what he's going to hopefully earn in free agency? I'm not sure. Right. And just to be clear, again, I said that's option C for me, but like, if they make the determination that Cam curls what they want, I trust them. Yeah. Which is something that I think is a little different than the way we've, you know, maybe we've said that, like, hey, you have to trust the coaches. We've kind of thrown our hands up the last couple of years. I think with this group, with their track record of DBs, if they say Cam curls what they want, they pay him a bunch of money, I'm going to trust that they know exactly what they're doing. They understand who the player is. They understand what his strengths are. They understand what his uh, weaknesses they have are. A role. They, have a they have a role cut out for him. Exactly. Um, some other names to flag. Marcus May, Harrison Smith, uh, likely cuts yeah. uh, or potential cuts, I, I would say. Uh, PFF has Smith marked for a pay cut. Uh, Marcus May, the the Saint safety, post June one cut potentially. So that's a position that could get a little bit deeper. I mean, Jamal Adams is kind of the big fish that's going to be out there. He has not right. been good since he's been in Seattle in part because he hasn't been able to stay healthy. But could you know Dan Quinn and, and Joe Witt Jr. see a role for Jamal Adams and be like, we know exactly what to do with that guy. You pay him some smaller yeah. amount of money. Uh, and and all of a sudden he's in the mix there. So I think that there's there's definitely some guys to watch that could be added to this list at safety as well. And I also think it's important just to note that like Cam Curl fits that unique body type that Dan Quinn has called out multiple times in press conferences. Witt has said similar things. They like guys with long arms. Cam has long arms. He can cover tight ends. He's got, I think they're 33 and a half. So like tackle length arms, maybe 32, like Oof. He's a big man, you know? And yeah. so I think they see that and they say, man, like he does a great job as the Buffalo Nickel. Man, he he matched up against Alan Lazard a couple of years ago, who's a true wide receiver. Like that's a good skill set. Like how do we maximize him? So I, I to, to, to kind of just bring this full circle, like in terms of saying they might value him, I think they do value that type of body type and that type of frame and that type of ability. It's just, to me, it comes back to the price tag and what's going on with that. You know, like if, if it fits financially with, the direction they want to go and you know like uh adam peters is a smart guy the league is going kind of going away from valuing the safety position unless you're like an elite player which makes a lot of sense because it's hard to find good players at that position so maybe they say we'll we'll get younger we'll find people that we can kind of indoctrinate in our system because you know every year in the draft there's always somebody who's kind of freaky in between that can play safety at a high level so yeah, for sure. And you, they want like super versatility. A guy like Duggar is certainly an option. So there, yep. there's options uh, in, in all corners. To be the area where they should spend big money is going to be edge. Yeah. Uh, however, it might be trickier than this list initially shows. <laughs> uh, I was texting with my guy, Anish Shroff, earlier today, uh, who's the play-by-play -play voice of the Carolina Panthers. And I was like, are they going to let... Are they going to let Burns go? And he just goes, no. So that is that has been all the reporting out of Carolina. I'm sure Anish doesn't mind me spilling that and name dropping him here because that is what everyone is saying. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, that's a, a guy that if he hits the market, 
I'm not saying you can't overpay him, but I would try. Like yeah. I would, I would spend a lot of money on a guy like Brian Burns. Um, and there's a couple of other top edges in this class. Uh, starting, I mean, obviously the the big name to watch is interior guy and in Chris Jones. Uh, he's the number one free agent available and we'll see what they're going to do with him but josh allen the jacksonville uh version of josh allen the edge player is there then you have brian burns in carolina um and then there's a couple of other guys i mean the interior d-line class is actually great as well you got Sick, Matabuke yeah. uh from from baltimore you got wilkins from miami but then you've got you know a couple of guys on the outside there's actually a couple of different guys that played in miami last year van ginkle ogba kind of down the list um but there's there's a couple of top edges um and you know, Hunter, Bryce Huff, another guy. Yeah. Bryce uh, Huff, from Hunter. the Jets. So like there's there's some guys out there that are available, Logan. And I, I don't know if one of these guys in particular catches your eye, but to me, this is the area where they need to find like you can both find a guy, pay him a bunch of money, and draft your guy uh, Robinson in the second half or in the second yeah. round. Like you need multiples here. Currently, the best edge under contract is KJ Henry. And all due respect to KJ. Um, I would like him to be a three or a four, not a, a one. Certainly, you know, if you have to live with him as a two, fine, but they they got work to do. No, I, I think that's 100% right, and I think we're saying the same thing. I think the thing about this that's interesting is, like, Josh Allen, do you, do, does Jacksonville tag him? Brian Burns probably going to get tagged, right? Like, Danell Hunter's 33, 34 years old, older guy, yeah. right? Like, do you Jadavion want to Clowney, same thing. Yeah, like, do you want to go out and break the bank for those guys? I don't know, Bryce, Bryce Huff, Bryce Huff, however you say his name. Uh, yeah, really Bryce excellent Huff. edge rusher from New York, but very situational in terms of use. Not an every down player, but maybe, you know, again, he's got a unique skill set. Maybe this administration says that's a guy that we want, that we value, that we think we can get, get after. Van Ginkle, again, I think a productive rotational piece. I don't think it's a guy you want starting, but there are opportunities. It's just about kind of, again, the like same thing we talked about with safety, identifying the right piece. Because I think what you take those top names off, you're like, man, like this is a this is a so we can get a solid player here, but it definitely lacks the star power and kind of the commitment that it felt like earlier. We were like, oh, pay him as much as he wants. After those top two guys, even Josh Allen, I wouldn't say the same thing. Honestly, I get a little bit quieter in terms of my endorsement of some of these players because there's going to be issues. Does, does that mean they're bad football players? Absolutely not. But again, it, the financial arrangement and the role becomes much more significant for those guys, uh, especially here in Washington. Yeah, I also do wonder if like a guy like Clowney could be interesting to buy yourself a year. I right? think that's exactly right. Yeah. Like, let's do the one year big money. We'll give you kind of what you want. You know, one year, I don't know, what would be, a, it's 20 million? 20, 20 you, would be, yeah. But that's yeah. a lot. It's a lot it's of a money. Lot, but if it's one year and that's money's coming off your books next year and next year you're not going to be picking second in the draft, maybe you'll be picking somewhere between eight and 16 and you can get a premier edge next year at that position and you, that's more of your long-term plan like maybe that's the play um, yeah. where you can you know take a guy in the second round this year and re-sign you know either it's James or Casey and bring in uh, another you know Van Ginkle level free yeah. agent and all of that helps build the room but no one's kind of playing out of role Clowney's your dude um, yeah. and you're reliant on him in a way that you really would prefer not to be, but at least he knows what he's doing in that. He that was very productive last year role. in Baltimore. Yeah, he was, and he gets to play next to Allen and Payne, and I think that's yeah. the other part of this is like schematically, what do they do knowing that their horses are inside, that those dudes are the ones that are going to make or break this defensive line. How do you surround them with enough talent that they can shine, but – you know, also don't do anything crazy. Like you're not going to trade a first rounder for Brian Burns. You know, right. like if your first rounder wasn't what your first rounder is, maybe in another <laughs> year on another roster, would I consider trading the 16th pick for Brian Burns? Sure. If I can lock him up long term? Yeah, probably. Probably I would. And maybe someone will do that for Carolina, but not this team this year right now. Um, right. That, that's certainly not, not in play. No, I totally agree. And again, like uh, you, I think you, explain that perfectly it's about role it's about fit it's about the vision for the organization and i and i don't think i think if you look at baltimore last year as a perfect example you bring in kyle vinoy you bring in uh, jadavian Clowney, and you're okay you're actually very productive because you're well coached you've got a strong interior and you're able to kind of get after people because you're playing with a lead all the time and i'm not saying that's what's going to happen here but i think that's kind of what you're looking at can you get some pieces to 
to just fill the roster out at this point. Guys that have upside that you feel good about. If you can't find that guy, don't overpay and don't overextend. And I think that's really what it comes down to. And I think we're saying the same thing. And um, again, it you they need to do something in free agency, and that could be post draft. I think there's a very high likely that likelihood, like you were saying, that a good edge, a guy that's played a lot of football that, that is serviceable, becomes available, and you can kind of get him in on the cheap. But I, I think it's something that they're, they're definitely going to look at. They're definitely going to do something there. It just depends on the level of commitment they want to make to the player and the financial commitment they want to make as well. So Yeah, no, that's always a position where there's just dudes floating around randomly, kind of after the draft, after yeah. or even in the training camp. You know, so some veteran who doesn't want to go to training camp and becomes <laughs> right. available week one. Not that you, that's who you want as your week one starter, but like sometimes them's the breaks. Uh, going through PFF's cut candidate list, Tyus Bowser from Baltimore is a potential cut candidate um, on the edge. Uh, there's one or two more, so sorry, this is not the greatest uh, podcasting we've ever done as I scroll here here um emmanuel agba from baltimore who i mentioned earlier is a potential guy and i think there was one more nope that's it but <laughs> there are a couple of tackles on this list and that's yeah. the last position that i kind of want to go into a little bit more depth with here so on the hypothetical cut list or uh, some of these guys like the guy i'm about to mention is a pay cut guy who probably stays where he is but you got andre dillard um from tennessee you have, uh, come on, come on, come on. You have, I wish there was a way. PFF, if anybody from PFF is listening, please sort. let us sort by position in the future. That That'd would be, be nice, very, yeah. very helpful. Uh, David Bakhtiari from Green Bay. Yep. Uh, then you have, I think there's one or two more. I mean, on the inside, Cody Whitehair at guard. Uh, and then you have DJ Humphreys from Arizona, who obviously was brought in by Cliff Kingsbury uh, back in the day. So uh, those are some of your potential cut options. And then you have the actual guys that are available in free agency as well. This would be great to get a tackle. And this is also a position that for the right guy, I would spend money. No, I think that's absolutely right. It's got to be the right role and fit here too. I, I just I just look at the draft, man, and I'm like, they probably don't have to make a colossal move. You know, it depends on how they handle Leno and his contract and what they're going to do with him. Um, and, you know, I know they can save some money if they you know, if they cut him or if they restructure his contract. Um, if they do something like that, I think, you know, a guy like um, uh, Humphrey, DJ Humphreys, is that his name? DJ? Yeah. If they bring it, I could see something like that happening. But I, I definitely see them making an investment in the draft on the offensive line. And I think it's going to be good because I think it's a very – I think it's a very deep group and it's got a bunch of guys that are going to be starting football players. So I think in the first three rounds, four rounds, you could probably find somebody that, that you're excited about that, that can play. And, uh, and I think that's fine. And so I don't think it, it, it and, and let me just put this in context. If I feel like they have to make an investment in the defensive edge rushing group here in free agency, I don't quite feel that same sense of urgency with tackle, for example, or, or guard. I think I think the draft is a little bit more dynamic in those areas and a little bit deeper. So I, will they? I think they might. Like Cody Whitehair, just as an example of somebody, you know, think about him coming and play left guard for on a two-year deal. Like, that'd be awesome. Man, yeah. And that really shores up that group and you get a bunch of veterans and guys that that are good football players. Like I played with Cody in Chicago, excellent football player, and I'm sure he's not going to be overly expensive. So that's a nice solid move and maybe it frees you up to – to kind of be a little bit more liberal with with what you want to attack in the draft. You know, maybe you can trade a second round pick for to move up a spot or do something like that. So um, that's what I think that's why this free agency period is going to be so big for this team, because it it gives you some flexibility on draft day to kind of draft the best player available or find the best fit for the team. So uh, I lied. One more position corner, because you mentioned it earlier. Kendall's yes. a free agent. You have Forbes, obviously, and then you have BSJ. What I guess part of this is what do they think BSJ is, which we obviously yeah. don't know yet. They don't know yet. They got to watch right. more film. They got to probably talk to him a little bit. They got to figure that out. But is BSJ outside and you're just living with it and then you're you're aggressively pursuing a slot and depth or is he a backup? but he's outside and you're just looking for someone to play over him straight up. You just don't think he's, he's worth starting. Um, or is he whatever option I haven't said yet, whether it's slot or outside. Um, yeah. and then you got to figure out, you know, who's the other one. So there's obviously tremendous corners, including Legereus Sneed who are available. I'd have to think that after the year that he, that Kansas city just had and how he played in the super bowl, like 
they're not letting Legarius Sneed out. Are well, they? are they going to let him go? Or are they going to let Chris Jones? They got a lot of decisions yeah. to make here, dude. So. They they do. Um, but would you? How how aggressively would you use some of that seventy plus, maybe eighty million dollars on on corner? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd be probably pretty, pretty pretty aggressive there. So, like, basically, I think what you're looking for is a starting caliber safety, a starting caliber corner, and a starting caliber edge rusher in free agency. Like, definitively, that's what I'd be looking for. So, do you re-sign Kendall Fuller? I mean, the number I saw was $14.7 million a year, and I think he's a good football player. Maybe you get him on a two-year deal. I don't know. I, I definitely think you need to do something there um, because I don't think after the year BSJ had, you know, and, and we're – I'm high on his potential, but, you know, had a tough year this year. Um, I think you need someone in the room that's a veteran that you feel good about that could make plays and uh, kind of hold down the fort while these two unproven guys um, kind of figure it out. And I think Kendall Fuller would be a great fit for that in terms of what this defense and what this defensive coordinator wants to be. You know, good tackling in the secondary, anticipating and, and turning the football over, which Kendall's shown ability to do. So is it Kendall Fuller? I don't know. But – I think luxurious needs is going to be pretty expensive and it's going to affect your ability to sign some of those other pieces we discussed. So um, I definitely think they need to make a move there, need to make a move at safety and probably edge. And, um, and as we've talked about, there are guys that you feel good about in those roles for sure. Yeah. Um, a couple of different names to watch out for. Uh, Jalen Johnson's the PFF's top corner on the market. Uh, one slot ahead of Snead. Uh, he played the last couple of seasons in Chicago. They've got Kendall ranked 15th overall. Um, Awuzie from Cincinnati, who used yeah. to be in Dallas. Uh, they've Dan Quinn's let him go once, but uh, Cincinnati paid him a bunch of money. Would, would that be a good uh, reunite situation there. Stefan Gilmore, who was last year in Dallas, obviously. Um, Steven Nelson was in Houston last year. Kenny Moore, Adoree Jackson. So um, Kenny Moore is like their 41st player. Jackson's their 82nd. So a pretty significant drop off there. Um, but yeah, uh, last thing I'll mention, just just for fun. This is, this is a, a funsies rib at Kevin Sheehan. Should they pursue Kirk Cousins in free agency? <laughs> um, I definitely kick the tires on it. I'll tell you, you know what I mean? I think like he's a good football player and he's been successful in the NFL for a long time. And I think Cliff has shown an ability to cultivate an offense to fill, to fill, to, to fit the, the player's skill set. So, you know, Colt McCoy, excellent performance against uh, the San Francisco 49ers. And he just, you know, he's not like this dynamic runner or scrambler and he did well in his spot duty. So I definitely kick the tires on it. See what it looks like. If I'm Kirk, would I come back here? Probably not, you know, yeah. but like, um, but I definitely, if I'm Adam, I'm like, Hey man, like, what's up? What are we talking about? And it's Remember gonna when something- we were going to trade for you a bunch of years ago or <laughs> sign you a bunch of years ago. And then we traded for Jimmy Garoppolo. That wasn't me. Yeah, no, I, I, I but I think you definitely, cause again, he's a starting caliber player that was before the injury was playing like a top 10 quarterback in the NFL. Yeah. So you're definitely going to look, investigate that. And, and, you, and we all know how Kirk is. We know his process. We know the type of guy he is. We know the type of ambassador he'd be for this organization. So absolutely. But you heard it here first. Kick the tires on that, then make it happen, and then uh, you know draft Marvin Harrison. And uh, That'd be sick. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. But No, I don't either. But I'd kick the tires on it. Let's just if say I was that. Kirk, I'd be like, quit kicking my tires. I'm not coming back. <laughs> All due respect to you and your ownership in the city. What did Kevin but, say? Did, was Kevin like all in on Kevin? It? Kevin's always all in on Kirk. Yeah, he. I, I mean, it's 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 kind of a bit, but there's more truth to it than I think he wants to admit. How do you feel about it? Would you? I mean, I I don't know. There's something weird about him coming back at this stage of the career. I mean, I, there's something that's cool about it. Yeah, thirty five year old. A 36 year old coming off of Achilles scares me for sure. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> I, I kind of think, I kind of think that at this stage of where Washington is, like you have the second pick in the draft, just take the quarterback and, right. and do it that way. Like don't overthink it, but like, look, can you do, could they compete next year in the NFC East? If Kirk like comes back and is Kirk and they yeah. did draft Marvin Harrison and they do some smart stuff on defense. Yeah. And why wouldn't you want to compete? So, like, it's it's certainly not a stupid idea. Um, I just I just think taking the longer vision is probably the best way to go because realistically, like, what are the chances you win a Super Bowl with Kirk coming off the Achilles and all that stuff? Not very big. Right. Um, and at that point, like, it's kind of the the Josh Harris, show me a path to eight and eight, and I can get you there pretty easy. Show me a path to like consistently competing, and that's a lot harder. And 
they could be eight and eight and they could honestly probably be 10 and, or I guess you can't be eight and eight anymore, but you know, nine Whatever. and eight, yeah. but 10, 11 wins maybe for a couple of years, but then what he's 38, yeah. you know, whatever. So yep. long story short, wouldn't do it, but that was a fun little bit. And now we got a fun. social media clip out of you. <laughs> Take Command Trivia time. Uh, it's the first time we've ever done this, but Logan, uh, Commanders have an entirely new or almost entirely new coaching staff. And so I thought it'd be fun for to, you know you and the audience to get to know the coaches and me. I just, I just, someone had to, you know, run the game. So I got to know them by doing the research here. Uh, but you, sir, you get to, to play the first ever Commanders coach trivia. Who are they? Yeah. Yeah, I'm really excited. I'm kind of nervous. We'll see how this goes. You know, it feels like a little bit of a setup, so we'll see. Hopefully, I knock this out of the park. Yeah, uh, this could be anyone from uh, the head coach to assistant position coaches. Oh um, God! Yeah, this could be this could be anybody. Uh, I will start with one that's I don't know if it's a warm up, but <laughs> instead of like a which coach is it, just kind of a get your brain going situation. Yep, uh, okay. So the Commanders have hired at least one coach from every division rival. So every other okay. NFC East team has sent a coach to Washington this offseason. Can you name one per team? So one Giants, yes. one Eagles, one Cowboys. Brian Johnson, Bobby Johnson, and yep. then uh, Joe Witt, right? Or, yeah. Or, yeah, that's it, right? Dan Quinn, uh, Sharif yeah. Floyd. Uh, there's another uh, guy, O'Hagian. Uh, yeah. So there's there's four from Dallas. But, yep, you got the other the other two, Brian Johnson. Uh, and Bobby Johnson uh, from from the Eagles and Giants is a line coach of, and pass game coordinator, right? Is that yeah, what you're doing? Yep, He's and assistant head coach, by the way, yes. and Brian Johnson got that title okay. as well. Um, as many have pointed out, after not getting Ben Johnson, they were determined to get every other B. Johnson in the league. <laughs> so you got Bobby, you got Brian, uh, and off we go. All right, uh, so now I've got just a couple of fun facts about a, a bunch of different coaches. Uh, some of these probably a little easier than others, uh, but let's. Let's start off. Honestly, this one was probably my favorite thing that I learned today. Oh, my God. Um, which coach on the commander staff has uh, his uncle, Jack Thompson, who was known as the Throwing Samoan. Uncle oh. Jack Thompson, the Throwing Samoan, was the third overall pick in the 1979 NFL draft. Which coach? Which coach? Um, I'm going to go quarterback coach, Tavita Pritchard. Does that sound That is a... It's well, tough. do I have sound effects here that I could I could go into this? I do the wacky have, bit there. I do have so some Tavita sound Pritchard effects. was retained and is on the staff as the quarterback coach for all that of is, you who didn't know. Yes, that is all correct. Um, it does look like we're uh, we're a little limited on sound effects. Eh? Yeah, that's a bummer. Oh well. Uh, all right, let's let's that was that was nicely done. Uh, let's go with. This one, I feel like I feel like you can get this one for sure. Oh, Which <laughs> Commanders coach coached Mike Tomlin at VMI? Ooh, VMI. Okay, so I know Dan Quinn coached there. Was he coaching with Tomlin, or was he coaching Tomlin? That's the question. Um, you're not going to give me a hint. Not even like you're warm or cold. No, I'm not going to give you a damn he thing. He coached. He coached Tomlin. That's the, what it is, right? That was the way I phrased the question. Yes. I'm going to say Dan Quinn. That is correct. Yes. And in fact, he both coached and coached with. That's why I couldn't give you a hint because oh, they were both correct. Okay. I was like, uh, yeah. Okay. It was his senior year, uh, Tomlin, and then he graduated and immediately joined the staff. Quinn was still there, so he both coached and coached with Mike Tomlin. That is correct. Logan Paulson. Wow. 2-1-0 on my very silly little game. And just for uh, a point of clarification, we did yes. not review these. So like this no. is real consternation, by the way. No, this is this is true. All right. Uh which Washington Commanders coach played for Cologne in NFL Europe in 2006? Played for Cologne. So which is a city in, a in Germany. So do we have a position or no? Mm, no, I feel like that would that might give it away. Give it away. All yeah. right, let's see. Um, in 2006? 2006. The year might be helpful. I'm trying to think if I know anybody. So obviously, Bobby Johnson, for, or not Bobby Johnson, um, Ingram is a former player, right? Receiver. Yep. Darrell Taff is a former player. Um, obviously, Ryan Kerrigan, but not to that level. Um, no, Ryan did not have to go to NFL Europe, nor, nor was he uh, 
old enough in 2006. Old enough? I mean, he, he was I mean, getting he was, recruited by Purdue then. Uh, this is tough, guys. This is tough. I'm going to say, was it Cliff Kingsbury? Uh, he's 3 and 0. Was it? Nice. It was Cliff. It was Cliff. Nicely done. Thank uh, you. Cliff barely played in the NFL. Uh, it took him two years to debut. Uh, in his first game, he went one for two. I don't know if he threw another pass after that. Um, so, yeah, Cliff's NFL career, very short. Pretty solid year in NFL Europe, but never never really developed. And then eventually was like, I think I, I, think I got the point. I think I'm going to go coach. Uh, now, that said, there is one commander's coach who was a teammate of Kingsbury's while he sat behind Tom Brady, and won his only Super Bowl ring. Who else was on that Patriots team that won Super Bowl 38? What year was that? Uh, I believe it was 2003. Oh my gosh, 2003? And they're a coach? They are now, yeah, that's the whole the whole game book. Is that no, I wasn't sure if they were like front office. No, 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 like, no, they yeah. were, no, they were a player on this team. A player. It's tough, guys. Um, said that every time you're three and oh right now i know this one i have really no idea i don't i couldn't tell you i'm gonna say offense defense can i get a hint uh i can't you'll understand why i can't give you a hint on that momentarily really yeah i can't i can't help you there offense or defense all right who is it it's because it's the special teams coach, Larry. Oh, God. I knew that, too. Jeez. Three time Super Bowl champ was on all three of those first three uh, Patriots dynasty teams. So, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I cannot give I'm you mad. a hint on I'm offense or defense because he is myself. the special teams coach. Because I knew that. I knew that one. Yeah. Um, all right. Who worked for Bill Parcells both as a player and a coach? Worked for Bill Parcells. As a player and a coach. <sighs> offense, defense? You really you really asking for this? It's it's offense. Offense. All right. Player and a coach. Anthony Lynn? That is correct. What? That's really? correct. His first his first NFL job was in 1992. He was a practice squad player for the Giants. Ultimately, his career never really took off. He had a, a knee injury late in his college career wow. uh, that led him to go undrafted. He was a backup and special teams guy. Won two Super Bowls as a backup running back to Terrell Davis with the Broncos. But his first playing gig was as a practice squad player for the New York Giants. He ultimately then retired, got into coaching, and went and coached running backs for Bill Parcells in Dallas. Wow. Good for him. There you go. All right, I got a couple of a couple of more uh, here, and then we have a very special portion of the program uh, that I will. It's not even going to be. It's not even going to be trivia. It's just going to be facts. I'm just gonna. <laughs> I'm just gonna blow your mind with information. Uh, so, uh, this coach is married to an Olympic hurdler. Olympic hurdler. That's yeah, a she tough is one. a she is a four hundred meter hurl, hurdler. She represents the nation of Colombia. I don't know and if that's going to be helpful or not. Is she retired or is she still active? No, she is still running? active, which might be helpful for you. That, that sounds like it's going to be helpful. I'm going to say William Gay. Uh, nope, it is David Blau. See, clearly you should watch more Hard Knocks. David Blau. Yeah, David Blau, assistant quarterbacks coach, freshly retired from playing himself. Oh, is that is him? Married from, to uh, yeah from Detroit, the same guy. Yeah, Good Detroit, him, Arizona. Man. Yeah, yeah. He's he's the assistant quarterbacks coach. He is married to Melissa Gonzalez, yeah. who is yeah, an okay. Olympic hurdler, and that makes him the brother-in-law of New England Patriot cornerback Christian Gonzalez, who should, in the eyes of many, be here instead of Emmanuel Forbes. Wow! Look at that! Look at that! Just what is that? Six degrees of Kevin Bacon, or whatever that is. Yeah. I, yeah. Dude, uh, that's David Blau. Good for you, man. Good yeah. for you. Um, there's a great clip from Hard Knocks a couple years ago of him uh, watching her. No, qualify. yeah, I've seen that one. Yeah, yeah so really good. All right, uh, I got I got two more uh, on, on both just where they played in college and what uh, positions they played in college is going to be the hint. And the additional hint for both of these is these two men do not currently coach the positions that they started at in college. Okay. So one was a wide receiver at Auburn. Who was a wide receiver at Auburn 
that now coaches something else for the Commanders. Wide receiver at Auburn. Oh, um, what's his name? Uh, Witt. Joe yeah, Witt. Joe Witt Jr. Yeah. That is correct. His dad was yeah. a legendary coach down there. He played wide receiver for a couple of years. Uh, I think coached wide receivers at the college level to start and then flipped over yeah, and to switched. the defensive side. And then last but not least, uh, started his college career at Iowa as a quarterback before moving to linebacker. To and linebacker. he coaches neither of those positions for the commanders. Is it? Um, I know David Rye went to Iowa. Is, that is not the, the guy the that I'm coach. talking about. He went to Iowa. He we say it again. So what, go one more time. It was Iowa quarterback and then moved to linebacker. Okay. David Rye did play quarterback at Iowa. I know that because he coached me at UCLA. Fun fact about that. There you um, go. And then he moved to linebacker. That's a tough, that's a tough transition there, guys. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's, uh, they were looking for, for defensive backs coach Tommy Donatel, who did eventually then from linebacker become a member of the secondary, but started at quarterback, nice. flipped to linebacker. Of course, his dad, Ed, was an NFL defensive coach most right. recently with the Vikings. That particular stint, the Vikings one, did not go well for Ed Donatel. But Tommy Donatel is your defensive backs coach. Okay, so that is all research, by the way, that I did on my own. But anybody who is on... psycho. <laughs> I, this is what happens when I have time off. Um, <laughs> anybody that is on Commander's Twitter knows there is someone who is way better at this than me. Uh, my guy, Teresh Manuel, uh, you've definitely been sent tweets of him before, TM Manuel on Twitter. Okay. Um, Teresh is a producer for Tegna, the parent company of WSA9, and he has just either the greatest research ability I've ever seen, an encyclopedic knowledge of every human that's ever met every other human on planet earth or both his ability to spit out connections is unbelievable so we have now reached what i'm going to call the teresh portion of the program all of the research preceding this is stuff i looked up on my own all of the rest was me going to teresh's twitter page and being like, all right let's see what he's got um i will say though there's one there is one trivia uh portion i want to do with this before just spitting information that it, i didn't look up and that is to ask you, Logan, which one of your former teammates, because I think there's only one, which one of your former teammates is on staff? Um, I have two former teammates on staff. Oh, is there two? I missed one. Yeah, Darrell Tapp and yep. Ryan Kerrigan. Oh, I forgot Kerrigan because he was an incumbent. He's a, he was on. an incumbent. I know. Duh, Kerrigan. Uh, ironically, both in the same position room. Yeah, yeah. Tapp with Washington in 2013. Uh, he was also a former teammate of Bobby Ingram in Seattle. Uh, but that's pretty surface level. Here's yeah. the kind of stuff you get from Teresh. Uh, we were just talking about Tommy Donatel. Uh, Donatel's brother Steve was on the Stanford coaching staff with Tavita Pritchard. Donatel also served on Jim Mora's staff at UCLA. Dan Quinn got his NFL coaching start under Mora when he was the DC of the 49ers, and they were together in Seattle as well. All right. That sounds like a good one. Layers. I mean, layers, it's kid. just the layers of it. It's like, it's, it's a lot of research to do. Yeah, um, but that's the thing, is he just knows this stuff. It's crazy. Uh, Bobby Johnson, John Pagano, Ken Norton, all new staff members here in D.C., yes. but have worked together before. Do you know for who? For who? Yeah. Well, I know Pagano was in Houston because he coached me there um, with Bill O'Brien, so probably not there because Ken Norton wasn't there. Was it Pete Carroll? I'm no, they were on Jack Del Rio's staff in oh, Oakland. Oh, nice. Yeah. And then here's here's the the big the big finish, if you will. Oh my god. We gosh, got we wait. got multiple layers. We got dudes most people have never heard of, and we got ties eventually to all three of the top quarterbacks. You ready for this? Yes. I can't right. wait. Top quarterbacks, love it. Let's see. Brian Johnson, new pass game coordinator, assistant head coach, was UFL teammates with LSU passing game coordinator Cortez Hankton, who, of course, coached Jaden Daniels last year. And Hankton, the LSU pass game coordinator, also knows Anthony Lynn from being on Jack Del Rio's staff in Jacksonville. That's that's one. So that's clearly, okay. clearly Jaden Daniels, the guy, right? Not so fast, <laughs> my friend. Lynn also worked with Freddie Kitchens, former Giants head coach, uh, who is now her offensive coordinator. I don't remember. Didn't go well. That's all I remember. Giants fans hate Freddie Kitchen. Anyway, he worked uh, 
with Anthony Lynn, uh, I believe on that same Jacksonville staff, who is now the run game coordinator at UNC, oh, where okay. he worked with Drake May. May was recruited by Phil Longo, now the OC at Wisconsin, who is very good friends with Cliff Kingsbury. <laughs> and well, you know the connection of Cliff and Caleb Williams. So boom, boom, boom. Connect the dot to whoever you want. Yeah. Good luck figuring that out. That's the Teresh portion of the program. Teresh, everyone follow. Job. Everyone follow Teresh. This wasn't me asking Teresh to do this. This was just me literally going to his Twitter page, knowing that I would find better information there than I could on any other portion of the internet. Yeah, he did a great job. I mean, those connections are pretty comprehensive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's unbelievably good at this. And the best thing is he'll then find clips. He'll be like, oh, uh, and by the way, check out this chat this guy did at a coaching seminar in 2003 that somehow was on YouTube and I have the link to. And I'm just like, good how do I him, hire man. you? Yeah. Good Teresh, you want to come work for Take Command? You want to come Take work for the Optimus yeah. show? I don't know if we can afford you, but we'll try. We offer... <laughs> We offer the benefit of being Logan and I's friend. All That's right. right. Uh, uh, later in the week, I have no idea what we're doing. Do you have any idea what you want to do later this week? I have no idea. What I mean, what's happening later? We can start doing draft stuff, maybe. Yeah, we definitely do can that. do draft stuff. We can do kind of a a final pre combine get together uh, of of guys that I think are going to have important weeks in Indy. Uh, next week we're in Indy, so good chance we sit down with some of our friends to do some interviews while we're there. Um, no idea on the schedule either. We might also bank some content to have over the next couple of weeks uh, that we are able to record in person. Uh, Logan and I will not only be there together, but obviously, you know, guys like Trevor Sikama. We'll see if we can get together with Matt Miller. Matt's either going to be on this show or on the Hoffman show. It's going to just depend on when Logan's flight gets into Indy. Right. Uh, so uh, that, that'll be fun. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a great week. There's so many great people uh, floating around. We'll see what we can do in terms of interviews next week. But uh, that's going to be really fun. And then we're we're headlong into actual free agency the week after that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's getting real close. And then draft season is upon us. So if you're not subscribed already and you've made it this far, you, you did well on the trivia or not, we still invite you to subscribe anyway. Uh, just wherever you're listening right now, the free Odyssey app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, or, of course, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you are subscribed. We'll see you later in the week. Uh, and until then, have a good one. And I won't see you on the radio. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command. First, why don't, you, why don't you like it? It lets other people know that it was good. And then they should watch it too. And, Logan, we have a new exclusive home for full episodes. We do. 1067 The Fans YouTube page. Go check it out and please subscribe. Yeah, do, do what Logan said. Do it. Very, very smart.